So, good afternoon everybody and a very warm welcome to this seminar on Somali diaspora humanitarianism. It's a great pleasure to see you here on this beautiful, beautiful day. There's a possibility of taking a dip right across the street afterwards if somebody is feeling overheated afterwards. But uh, for now, a very warm welcome um, to this uh, seminar. My name is Naya Kleist. I'm a senior researcher here at DIES and I'm also the coordinator of the research uh, project called Diaspora Humanitarianism in Complex uh, Crisis. And we are here today because the team is in town. Our uh, Somali and Kenya research team, almost everybody is uh, here in Copenhagen in these uh, days because we are having our annual meeting. So it's also really a great uh, pleasure to welcome you here uh, once again. Uh, so what we'll do today is to uh, present our findings in our research project so far. We have been going on since uh, February 2020. Here you can see us pre-COVID-19 at the project launch. Clearly some people are more better in being photo photos uh, than others. Uh, so we are a team of, uh, of yeah, 10 people all together. Uh, looking at Somali diaspora humanitarianism from different uh, angles. And when we talked about this seminar, we discussed what we want to do. And the conclusion was we want to engage with our key stakeholders in Copenhagen. And we are happy to see you here in the room. Somali diaspora actors, Danish Refugee Council, researchers and others with a keen interest in these uh, issues. So what we are going to do is that I will quickly present uh, the overall program. Then we have a surprise. I will disclose that later. Um, and after that, uh, the team here, our three PhD candidates and uh, one of our postdocs will quickly present uh, their findings as a kind of conversation starter for the uh, uh, discussion that will follow that. Um, and after that, there will be a moderated discussion and then we'll open up uh, for questions and comments uh, from the floor. So please uh, remember your uh, questions and comments when we come to that. And after that, there'll be a nice reception with sambusa, samosas um, for those of you here. So we call it diaspora humanitarianism. What is it? Uh, a very brief overall uh, explanation can be to to uh, define as at emergent, uh, emergency assist assistance, so support sent to disasters, emergencies in the uh, country of origin or homeland uh, sent by groups living outside that country. So that could be refugees, migrants, generations of, uh, of refugees, uh, the descendants of uh, migrants and uh, uh, refugees. Uh, and that such uh, support goes is usually transferred through existing social uh, networks or networks that can easily be mobilized. Uh, it across, connects across location, actors, and scales. And on the uh, world map there, you can see the five biggest refugee diaspora, so to speak. The Somalis uh, is the fifth uh, biggest. And it's just to give you an example of how such uh, diasporas can be uh, uh, can be dispersed across the world. It's also very important to state that collaboration with local actors is very important and pertinent. Without that, it's actually not possible to do any kind of such uh, assistance. Our research program asks as the overall uh, question, what kind of assistance do Somali diaspora groups mobilize, channel and deliver to Somalia and the Somali region, Somaliland, during complex crises, and what are the effects? And that's like the overall question. Then we have individual research projects that look at different aspects uh, and sides of this. Uh, we are all together 10 researchers, as I said before, three PhD candidates, and now I'll just briefly mention the names. So we have with us Sarah Ahmed Kushin sitting here, Abdi Rahman Idle Ali, Fatima Dahir. Then we have, uh, or we had, uh, two postdocs, one of them Jethro Norman from Dies, and another Ahmed Musa, who uh, was located in Somaliland. All our colleagues are our senior or supervisor colleagues, is Karuti uh, Kanyinka from University of Nairobi, sitting there, Obadia Okinda, sitting there, and Mark uh, Bradbury from Rift Valley Institute, sitting over there. And not least, we have Peter Albrecht from uh, Dies. Uh, also in the room, of course. 
Um, yeah, it's a four-year program. As I said before, we started just before COVID-19 hit uh, the world. Uh, and that also means that we may not be so far in the, pro in the process as we thought uh, we would. We have been affected by COVID-19 as everybody else. We're also writing about COVID-19, but that's another story. Uh, so we go on at least until uh, 2024, 20, uh, maybe longer. This also means what we present today is like kind of midway findings. Uh, but we, I think, start to have a fairly good idea of what goes on. Uh, we have focus on the Somali regions, uh, as well as Kenya, Sin, Denmark, uh, Zambia and the UK. So what we do a lot is to look at what goes on between these different localities. So what goes on, for example, between Kenya, uh, Nairobi and Mogadishu, or between uh, Denmark and Hagesa, uh, so to speak. So these kind of multiple locations and uh, corridors, uh, so to speak, are, su are very important in our work. And finally, I should say that uh, the program is funded by the Danish uh, Consultative Research Committee, also called FFU, so that is through uh, Danida. Most of you in the room know about the Somali diaspora, but just very briefly, uh, Somali diaspora groups are located all over the world. On the map here, you can see like the most densely inhabited uh, regions according uh, to color. And what is important to know here, just as a kind of very brief background, is a long and very established tradition of support across uh, sites, or what we also call transnational relations. So people send remittances uh, to their family, friends and kin, all in all different kinds of directions. So a lot to the Horn of Africa, Africa across, but actually also in other directions. And this is important to keep in mind that despite sometimes quite pronounced um, challenges in terms of economic situation, etc., Somalis by and large actually really do send a lot of support. And so why is all this important? It's important because diaspora groups are humanitarian actors. They send remittances, as I, sent, uh, as I said. Uh, there's sustained engagement over time. Uh, there's fast mobilization of resources. In some cases, this is something we can get back to. There's access to places that international humanitarian agencies cannot uh, reach. Um, and it's also interesting from a research perspective uh, that there's often an ambiv ambivalent relationship between diaspora groups and uh, the international humanitarian system. Not always, but there are some uh, tensions. And finally, again, from a research perspective, there's a nascent literature. So there's things to be done. We don't know everything yet, or if we will ever. So, so far, so good. Midways, uh, some of the issues that we're discussing. So being researchers, we discuss, so what is diaspora? Is this really the good term? What about humanitarianism? Is this really what we're looking at? Uh, that comes with being uh, uh, researchers. We are also focusing on local actors, so not only diaspora groups. Again, we'll hear more about that. We look at different crises and the different responses that uh, generate the meanings of gender and generation, uh, politics and religion, and also multiple humanitarianism. So is it very distinct from other kinds of humanitarianism or is it uh, entangled? This is also something that we'll hear more about today. So this is the end of this short uh, presentation. You can read more about uh, what we do at the website up there, or you can grab a policy brief that we wrote in the beginning about diaspora humanitarianism. There are copies uh, out in the room where the reception uh, will also be. And now to the nice surprise. Because Somalis are a nation of poets and poetresses, and we have with us today a Somali poet. That is Sarah, and Sarah will recite a poem for us. Please, Sarah. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. So can you hear me? Yes. And now I can hear you. Fantastic. Um, I am going to uh, read one of my poems from my book, Sounds of Laughter, an anthology 
of poems from the heart of the Somali woman. Yeah, the, the poem is called I Am a Somali Woman. I chose this poem because today we're speaking about Somalis and women, you know, are very important in society in Somalia. The poem is in Somali and English, so I will read the Somali version first as, you know, as a courtesy to the Somali um, um, visitors here today. And I'm happy to see quite a big group of Somalis here. I am a Somali woman. Wahana hai kabar Somaliyad. Wahana hai nafturaha wala shis. Wahana hai barado ibiyaha suka edidi. Wahan ahay wadaad ka degaan ka inanta u dalay. Wahan ahay dawi i ka an ka dul mi didahi tila hiray, tila habisay. Wahan ahay tila jirdilay, la irshay, la afdubay, la kufsaday. Tila daday, ti ala dadin. Wahan ahay daren suban, wahan ahay kabar somaliyad. Dir keigu wa duhul madaw iya faan madroodi. نيد دائر وعلوين وحان أهي حاملو أفو هويو كلقيد كورساء أرمالو أقب قدب تر يقدب ريب لو أذيك سدو ميد قور لغو قصبي علاد لغو حكيي وحان أهي قبر سوماليات دول من ما إيهي وحان أهي حرفيق ما إيهي حرفيق دمر بل سي وحان أهي حرفيق دمر أه وحان نديفيا ودوين كغارن كيغا وحان كيغا فعود تيغي كوو تشوغا ايو كوو قدال إيمان دونا وحان أهي كبر سوماليات اسكول كا إنان كيغا إنان كان دالان او دودا دوكسيغا إنان تا آن دالي ايان او هدلا وحان او دعيا او او جيدي ايو إنان كيغا رون اي حيران وحان او دعيا هو يدي دا اسبتال كتالا وحان الله أو الله بريا هل أبورك أي كود كل عيان ودوين كصومالية وحان هاي كبر صوماليات ما إن كي جان هدلا وحان هاي هل بولة ومدة وحان تجا عسمدة كروة مقدشو أفجوي أرجابو هرجيسة قال كعيو بوساسو بلدوين بدن بوعم إيميل كسته أونل ينروح تالو وحان هاي كبر صوماليات وحان كعيا دقالها وحان هرمريا تكنولوجيا دا وحان نوليا برشا دا ما حق ما أولي يها إنا كل السنة دو ها وحايا لي كبر سومالية تبانا هاي ما حد سنة دين So that was the Somali version of the poem and now I'm going to read the English version I am a Somali woman I am the sister of the matter. I am the potato seller at the local market. I am the daughter of the local sheikh. I am the injured at the revolution, the protester, the, the protester, the jailed, the detained. I am the tortured, the exiled, the kidnapped, the raped. I am the veiled, the non-veiled. I am a beautiful soul. I am a Somali woman. My skin is of ebony and ivory. I am young by spirit, old by experience. I am the pregnant, the wife, the single mother, the widow. The god of tir and god of reb tool forcing me into marriage as the compensation payment for another clan's peace settlement. I am a Somali woman. Yet I am not a victim. I am a leader, not a woman leader but a leader who happens to be a woman. I clean up the streets of my nation. I raise up the past, the present, and the future generations. I brought the Nobel Peace Prize to Somalia. I am a Somali woman. I speak out for my son at school. I speak up for my daughter at the madrasa. I pray for my ancestors and for my older son in jail. I pray for my mother in the hospital. I speak out for our artists whom they keep bombing in theaters 
and on the streets. I am a Somali woman. I speak out from my mind. I am the pulse of the people. I live in the city, in Garaway, Mogadishu, Afgoye, Erigavo, Hargeisa, Galkayo, Bosaso, Baladwain, Bodan, Boame, and every corner where there is life and sound. I am a Somali woman. I am synonymous with strength and victory. I celebrate sisterhood. I celebrate motherhood. I boost the economy. I advance the technology. I give life to the community. Do I deserve to be equal to you? Yes, I do, because I am a woman, a Somali woman. Thank you. Thank you much, so much, Sarah. That was amazing. It will be hard to follow for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we will do that. So now I invite Fatima to uh, present her research. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Um, Zahra's poems always make me emotional and I feel like I can relate to them. I was holding my tears back there, so um, hopefully I can deliver in the same manner. Um, so my name is Fatima Dahir Mohamed. Um, I'm one of the PhD students and my p on for my PhD I'm focusing on the socio-technical systems of diaspora humanitarianism and how this actually, um, they shape or influence the whole process of mobilization and distribution. So for my research, uh, there are two, I had two sites initially, Mogadishu and Isli Nairobi. Uh, I've already done some data collection in both uh, of the two. I've done a scoping visit to Mogadishu and at some point things changed. So now I'm also doing, uh, I also have to do a second round of uh, data collection in Dolo and Belet Hawa, which is in Gedo region in Somalia, part of Jubaland. So whatever I'm going to present today are initial findings from the first round of uh, data collection. So as I said, uh, my for my PhD, I'm focusing on the social technical system. So what do I mean when I say social technical systems? So I'm looking at what platforms are being used, so social media platforms. I'm looking at the gender dynamics within the process of mobilization and also uh, process of distribution, what roles are being played by men, what roles are being played by the women. And then I'm also looking at the generational dynamics. I want to see what the elders are doing in comparison to what us younger people are doing. And then finally, I'm looking at uh, issues along the lines of uh, inclusion and exclusion, both at the mobilization uh, phase and also the distribution phase. So if I go to my key messages or key findings, uh, the first one is that um, I found that there has been um, an evolution of Somali gathering spaces from the famous tree where old men or council members would sit and discuss our problems and make decisions. That has changed into conference hall or community halls. Uh, now those discussions and important decisions were actually being made in the halls, in the conferences, which is more of modernization. And then as time went by, we've also moved to uh, mainstream media. I've been calling it traditional media and I got a bit of backlash because uh, television and radio apparently is not that old. It's 50 years is not too old. Um, so yes, then we moved to radio and we w there was a time where crisis and mobilization would actually be done on radio and then also on TV. I remember 2011, I was very small, um, <laughs> there was mobilization for the drought and I saw a lot of sheikhs doing summons on television and actually people from the diaspora calling in and pledging and sending in uh, their contributions. So now to my era of young people, uh, social media. So now we see that uh, the, the gathering space has become, uh, I'm not saying that we've completely moved away from that, but it's going in parallel. There are still town hall meetings being done. There are still, uh, the radio and the TV is still being used, but uh, to complement, social media has come into the, into the picture. And we see that a lot of mobilization is happening in social media platforms. And some of the social media platforms being mentioned are YouTube, 
uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, which is very common, and I focus on uh, the utilization of uh, Facebook pages by sheikhs and also WhatsApp groups. So that leads me to my second point on the role of uh, social media platforms. Uh, so they have provided uh, a powerful tool to mobilize resources, but also to coordinate uh, relief efforts and share vital information and also for monitoring and accountability. I'm sure every Somali in this room is part of a WhatsApp group for their uh, kinship or their family and there's a lot of fundraising going on and there's a lot of um, information being shared within, within these groups about the situation back home and encouraging others to contribute and also there is accountability in that. We know the I'll use Copenhagen diaspora because you guys are here. So there would be um, a list going around uh, in the round virtually in the WhatsApp groups uh, saying Copenhagen people have contributed X amount. Duale, because I've just met you and I remember your name, has contributed X amount. So there's a lot of um, openness, transparency, accountability within the platforms. Um, also, the platforms has brought together, it's not just the diaspora. These platforms are composed of people in Somalia, in the rural places, in the urban places, people in the diaspora from different parts, but are related uh, in terms of uh, kinship or clan. And then uh, next, uh, a bit on the Facebook. I know I have seven minutes. I don't want to get too passionate and and <laughs> go into detail. So for the Facebook, uh, from my findings, it's that it does play a crucial role, but to disseminate information, and it's mainly used by sheikhs. These are religious leaders who have a large followership, and they utilize their social uh, capital in that there is trust placed on them, and people trust what they say. So if they say there is a drought here and, and we need to mobilize, people actually contribute and, and mobilize. And then my next point, which is on um, unintended, in, unintended consequences of uh, the platforms, digital platforms. So what has the digitalization of mobilization done to, to, to the whole uh, process of giving within the Somali community or mobilizing for, for resources in the Somali community? It's evident that it has changed or has given agency to certain people or certain groups of the community that initially would not have um, that uh, position, such as the youth. Youth are now taking up positions in actually uh, being the ones uh, creating these initiatives, leading these initiatives, where initially it was uh, the elders and, and the sheikhs, but now because of these platforms, any of the youth can actually um, create an initiative and fundraise for it. It has also enabled, for the example of WhatsApp, uh, it has enabled the inclusion of the elderly because in these groups, they are illiterate people, they are elderly, they are educated, they are business people. But within these groups, there are no writing of messages in as much as there is pictures and posts and videos and audios. This makes the whole process inclusive. So even the one who can't read, even the one um, uh, who is not literate, uh, who cannot try it. Now they can just record the audio. Now they can listen to the audio. But not to romanticize uh, the whole uh, digitalization is the fact that in these processes, there are people that are left out uh, because there is exclusion in both the mobilization within the platforms because if, it's, if a platform is for my kinship, of course I have access. You don't have access. So there is access issues. And then there is the whole issue of the digital divide. Uh, who actually has um, access to mobile phones in the rural areas in, in Somalia? Who can buy uh, the internet? We say internet is actually cheap in Somalia, but can everybody afford? And then initially there was an issue of, for example, the WhatsApp groups, the number of members was, I think, 250, and then it kept growing. But good news, now uh, WhatsApp has expanded. Now there's WhatsApp community, I think. It has a thousand of a thousand people, so I think this is uh, positive and uh, would uh, bring down the digital divide. Okay, my time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fatima Abdi Rahman. It's now your turn. 
Thank you, Naya. Uh, my name is Abdurrahman Idla Ali, a PhD student from University of Nairobi and University of Copenhagen. Uh, my research also focuses on diaspora humanitarianism, but uh, uh, my case, yeah, my case study looks at uh, uh, politicization of diaspora humanitarianism, the case of uh, support mobilization from Isli neighborhood Nairobi. Isli is a commercial neighborhood dominated by Somalis uh, across uh, the Somali ecosystem from Ethiopia, Kenya, and even Somalia. It's a huge neighborhood that has uh, uh, commercial buildings. This picture might be blood, but it is a snapshot of Isli. This is what happens uh, in this major commercial uh, neighborhood. And Somalis here are engaged in humanitarianism. They do mobilize humanitarian resources and they uh, intervene uh, during crises in Somalia at different times, whether it is uh, flooding times, droughts, uh, major explosions like Zobe, what happened. All these times they have been at the front line of uh, uh, interventions to help their, uh, their, their people back home. So my major research question of uh, the project is that um, I look at uh, the relationships that are developed and the interests that are manifested uh, between the Somali diaspora in Isli and the uh, recipient communities back in Somalia. Uh, methodologically, I'm using a multi-sided approach whereby I look Isli as uh, uh, aid givers or donors and uh, then Mogadishu as uh, uh, both donor and recipient uh, sites. Uh, initially, I thought Mogadishu as a recipient uh, location, but I found that at Mogadishu level, they also uh, mobilize resources to rural areas. So uh, they are not only recipients, but uh, they are also uh, mobilizers and givers of uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, the main highlights of this research uh, so far uh, is that uh, there is strong partnership between uh, diaspora community and local uh, people back home or even in the near diaspora uh, across the Somali uh, uh, inhabited uh, regions. You find that uh, the, cap the financial uh, capability and the status of uh, Somalis back home is also improving every other day. There are opportunities coming up. Uh, it's not like 30 years ago when there was uh, war everywhere and uh, there are little opportunities and you find a lot of uh, Diaspora now are going home back to look for opportunities there, whether it is business uh, investments or getting employed at the, uh, at the international organizations that operate in Somalia, or how they dominate even uh, government appointments or civil services in, uh, back home. So you find uh, opportunities are also very much coming up from the home country. So people are having uh, on the ground also the uh, capacity to contribute now to uh, humanitarian activity. So it is no longer a diaspora issue. Uh, there is strong partnership. You find uh, them in different uh, associations and they join hands to mobilize resources. So as much as diaspora give also, the locals also do contribute uh, to uh, a cause. And usually they either do in uh, clan-based mobilization or uh, religious mobilization, uh, both at the local or diaspora level. Uh, that's not so what I mean. There is uh, an emergence of a strong partnership uh, in that aspect. There is also the dominant uh, form of uh, mobilization of resources is through kinship or clan, sub clan based, usually done in WhatsApp forums uh, lately, as Fatima also has alluded, and uh, faith based or religious based mobilizations that happens at the mosque levels. So you find uh, uh, that they are engaged in different forms of mobilizations, though they all give to humanitarianism, they again do it differently. Whereas the clan or the kinship associations are focused on their own clan or locations they uh, come from, the mosques are, uh, do target uh, what I call spectacular events or common uh, 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 crises that are uh, cross-cutting and are huge compared to uh, the target of the sub-clan. And examples of uh, the faith-based uh, or religious uh, groups, particularly the mosque is the center of mobilizations. What they have uh, so far intervened over years is uh, crises is like what happened in Beledwene 2011 where there was severe floodings. Uh, they have done uh, mobilization 
of uh, uh, funding uh, at this level. Also, Zobe bombing, where we, we have uh, information that over 500 people were killed. There was uh, a very intensive mobilization at the mosques, and that was delivered as a package uh, to all uh, people that were affected by that kind of crises. So uh, the clan, as I said, they target very much on their own areas of, uh, of settlements or uh, they give back to people they are related by blood. So that is a main uh, difference on how they engage. Uh, it is apparently the, uh, the Somali diaspora and their uh, counterparts back home also do engage uh, beyond humanitarianism. So it's not everyday humanitarianism. They are also involved in a lot of development work, schools, uh, building, uh, hospitals, bridges. You find them engaged in different aspects of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, development and uh, even state building initiatives uh, that is uh, beyond humanitarianism. Uh, at the end of it, I'm uh, also uh, giving, bringing out the point of uh, in any giving, as my topic also is uh, politics of giving, and I use this to explain that you find that uh, there are uh, issues that emerge out of this kind of uh, giving that hinders uh, the uh, well-intended uh, intention of, of giving or uh, of humanitarianism. And among these things that uh, uh, I highlight is that you find that individual diaspora and locals do advance interests as they give uh, aid and you find them uh, at the front line of uh, government appointments uh, and uh, even uh, contracts, you know, uh, all, all these aspects. And uh, that brings about, you see now, uh, they use the aid to also get interest that they are after. And uh, it is a common knowledge that uh, diaspora has uh, a relative representation in Somali parliaments across, whether it is federal state or uh, state member uh, governments. Uh, all along, and uh, that is uh, quite this relationship between how they find themselves appointed to these influential positions and uh, what they have been involved in as humanitarianism over time. So uh, that is one thing that has come out. Also, the mosques are not also neutral. You find also the way they give and whom they cooperate with back home is also uh, not neutral. Uh, you all understand that there are different uh, schools of thoughts of Islam or uh, or different mosques are aligned to different uh, uh, sects of, of, of Islam. And when they give back, they always work with people back at the home. And in that aspect, you find that there's sometimes contestations uh, do come out. And uh, that also uh, is, uh, uh, is not good for, 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 for the neutrality bit of uh, the principle of humanitarianism. And at one time, you all remember, um, uh, those of you who have been following that, Sheikh Umar of uh, Isli has uh, taken aid to Mogadishu and uh, the al Sunnah wal Jamaah have protested against it, courtesy of the differences they have in uh, ideology. And finally, uh, my time is up, I would like to say also there is a trend that uh, the dominance of the diaspora in uh, government positions has also brought about a new emergency of trend of youth migrating from the country, coming back to uh, looking opportunities from across here, so that they become relevant and they go back with the passport of the Western countries such that they get opportunities back home. So, uh, and there's a uh, common saying now back home that wa So, in a way, uh, the diaspora also, uh, they are contributing to out-migration of youth from the country. Thank you very much. Thank you so, thank you so much, Sabti Rachman. Sarah, once again, the floor is yours. So I'm back again, and um, I looked at um, women, understandably. <laughs> so I'm gonna, um, in seven minutes, tell you what I did for my research project. So my project focuses on the role of Somali women in mobilizing, delivering, and disseminating aid. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah? fantastic. Um, so I chose uh, the case study of um, because it's very important to be very specific in your research, you know, because you, um, you know, produce more, you know, qualitative data. So I focused on the case study of Kardo, a, a town or district in Puntland, 
uh, I looked at the flash floods that occurred in April of 2020. There was a massive, um, you know, a huge um, flash floods that occurred and um, it, it led to, you know, huge displacement, loss of life, destruction of infrastructure. And I was looking at the role uh, of the diaspora. Uh, you know, there was a lot of response from the Somali diaspora, but also from Somalis within the country and um, also from the federal government. You know, they sent uh, airplanes of food and sent money, about one million. And uh, the Pulan government set up a committee uh, to oversee the distribution of this aid. There was even a hashtag, um, there was even a hashtag, um, you know, uh, pray for Kardo, hashtag pray for Kardo, uh, but also in Somali, Gurmud Kardo, hello Gurmud Kardo. You know, so there were all kinds of uh, responses on social media. Young people were very patriotic about this. And um, the government of Pulan set up a national bank account number for, to make it easy for everybody to distribute money and uh, to send money, I mean. So, um, so I looked at I, how do Somali business women in Zambia, um, you know, take part in all of this. I chose this because um, I, want, I was interested in the role of the private sector or business people, if that is sustainable, if it differs from the other, you know, s uh, diaspora, uh, um, you know, uh, who not are necessarily, who are not necessarily business people. Um, so I did my field work in Lusaka, in Zambia, and Kardo. I've been doing this since 2020 on different time, different time periods. I went there initially for inception um, phase. I uh, also met with these women. I was there just about a month and a half ago, uh, and uh, I'll be traveling to Kardo in August, September, uh, for for final round of uh, data collection. Um, so why Zambia? Um, there's a historical link between Puntland and Zambia, historically. Uh, there were a group of Somali drivers who, uh, you know, left, uh, who, who um, came from Zambia to, uh, from, from Mogadishu, Somalia, to, to uh, uh, Zambia to help rebuild the country. On, as, a, as a result of an appeal made by the late Kenneth Kaunda, uh, Zambia had just recently gained, uh, then, um, you know, independence, were looking for support. Somalia had been independent for a number of good years uh, were very, uh, you know, progressive, and the Somali government, in collaboration with the Zambian government, sent 66 Somali drivers. Most of them hailing from ethnically from Puntland, went there, and they stayed after their term of work was, you know, had ended, and uh, they brought their families, their wives and children, and a, for a diaspora was formed there. So I'm looking at this group of Puntlanders and how connected they are to Puntland through the distribution of aid when calamity occurs, when there's a disaster. And I was looking specifically at the role of women and comparing that to the Somalis who came in the 1990s. So there's a, you know, a large group of Somali uh, people in this, in my case, women who left Somalia as a result of the war and ended up in Zambia. So is there differences? Uh, are there differences between, you know, in giving, in mobilizing, in being connected to Puntland uh, between this group who is, you know, long established diaspora versus -vis this group that came in the 1990s. So having done this research, what emerged, you know, first of all, my research findings show that business women and female refugees, you know, they play an important role in Somali diaspora humanitarianism. Even though their role is invisible, it's not well documented, they play a crucial role. And I'm sure the Somalis here will agree with me that when something happens, uh, like a disaster, uh, Somali women often sometimes uh, not only collect from their bill the money that they're giving to so in Somalia, for example, but also um, they, um, they even sometimes sell their property, their gold, so that they take part in, the, in, the supporting, in supporting their families. Um, so these women are running intercontinental businesses and that makes it um, easier for them to distribute aid. In the case of Cardo, this happened on the first day of Ramadan when, the, you know, the flash floods. And in the morning, these women by, by 6 a.m. So during the Fajr prayers, they had already disseminated mattresses, drinking water, blankets to the affected community. Even before the government intervened, they were already on the ground because of their transnational links and presence in Puntland, particularly in Bosaso. I found out that they are giving different ways. They are given as individuals, they are given as a group, 
in t you know, financially and also resources. They are also giving out to Somali, uh, you know, disaster affected communities through uh, the, the community of Somalis who are there. So both men and women. Another important finding is that uh, this giving is very much linked to history. You know, it's passed on by parents and grandparents to their children to say it's good to be connected to home. B you know, be caring for your family. So this new generation of Somalis who were born in Zambia have Zambian citizenship. They are very much still connected. Another thing that I found out lastly or finally is that gender relations change. You know, I was looking at to what extent does migration also contribute to women becoming agents of change as decision makers in sp social spaces that otherwise will not guarantee them that in Somalia, for example, being a very patriarchal society where decision making, you know, happens, uh, you know, uh, in, in circles that are, you know, led by men. How does, how does this affect women's agency and contribution to so uh, society? Um, yeah, so that's it really. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Then finally, uh, Jethro Norman here from uh, Dees will talk about his uh, postdoc research. <coughs> okay, hello everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Jethro. I'm a postdoc uh, on the on the Dihon project. Um, and for my research, uh, I wanted to focus really on how diaspora aid uh, was received on the ground uh, within communities uh, in the Somali territories. Um, so, and here I'm really looking at a, a form of diaspora aid. Am I uh, fuzzying? Yeah. It's not used to me shouting down it. It's my Manchester accent, probably. Um, uh, looking at a form of diaspora activity that is distinct from family to family remittances. Uh, so, in that sense, it occurs at a much more organized uh, level, uh, usually at the level of the sub clan or, or the, jilib, uh, the village level. Um, so, very briefly, my fieldwork was multi sited. So, I travelled across uh, Somaliland. Uh, it was focused mostly on the border areas uh, from the far west uh, in Zela and the border of Djibouti uh, and in the far east as well uh, in the disputed territories, uh, also in Las Anod. Um, so, it was around five and a half months, uh, involved over 100 uh, different um, interviews uh, in 25 different settlements uh, across four of the six regions of Somaliland. Um, so, the idea was to speak to very much a range of different people. Uh, in different places, um, so these included crisis-affected communities, um, returned diaspora, elders, uh, youth, women, um, religious leaders, uh, professional aid workers, government officials. Um, but the focus was very much on these borderland areas. Uh, and why is that? Um, well, they're almost by definition areas of contested political order. Um, and they're also some of the areas where you have the most acute humanitarian need. So. Historically, large parts, and particularly in the East, have been uh, off limits for some NGOs to reach, uh, but not for, for many diaspora. Uh, so this means that they're also very interesting places, essentially, to look at the collision of different forms of aid. Um, put simply, it matters very much uh, where aid comes from. Uh, and this is sort of one aspect of the research that I want to focus on in the remaining five minutes, or whatever I have. Um, but to begin with, I want to just illustrate this with some pictures um, that many of you will probably be familiar with. Uh, so when NGOs do a project in Somalia, they very often, or anywhere, they often put up uh, big uh, metal billboards like this, or maybe like a nice mural here. Um, and the purpose of this is to kind of announce the project, to display the NGOs, the logo, uh, the donors, the amount of money that's been raised, uh, very often, uh, you know, how the money has been spent. Um, and they're a pretty ubiquitous sight uh, when you travel around, as I'm sure uh, most people know. Um, these are two different pictures of different projects. Uh, they're actually funded by the Somali diaspora. Uh, so on the left is a recently constructed uh, school. Uh, and on the right is a pretty ambitious road project, um, about 17 kilometers long. And it was sort of beginning construction as I was there. Um, and if you were driving just through these areas, you wouldn't necessarily know this as an outsider. Um, there aren't any metal placards, there aren't any logos, there's no sort of publicized accounting uh, necessarily of the amount raised. Um, there aren't any offices from the diaspora that you can visit or any sort of SUV you can sort of see branded going past. Um, but simply there doesn't need to be. Um, so everyone who's sort of using the school or indeed the road, they know this information um, because the diaspora that contributed are often uh, as uh, Abdirahman and others have alluded to, uh, extended kin members uh, and are typically known to each other through the clan. Um, 
but they're also spread across the world, right? So from Oslo or Copenhagen or wherever. So what we have here then are two very different forms of aid and development. Uh, one that's based, uh, at least in my research areas, um, loosely around the logic of kinship uh, and kinship groups, uh, and another that's run through networks of uh, international NGOs, states and donors. Um, but what I was interested in was what happens on the ground uh, uh, when these kind of different humanitarianisms uh, uh, coexist or indeed compete in the same places. Uh, you know, do they seek to just ignore each other? Do they mimic? Uh, do they cooperate? Do they delegitimize each other? Uh, and what we, we sort of found traveling around was, you know, within Somali communities, there's often a considerable debate actually, and even tensions concerning the practices and the values of different forms of aid. Uh, and I'll briefly, because uh, I'm probably running out of time, uh, highlight a few examples of how. Uh, these are just very few. Um, so some of the most vocal critics actually uh, within communities of diaspora humanitarianism, um, this probably isn't so surprising, uh, local NGO professionals. So here is uh, Abdi, and he's a, a, an NGO professional uh, from Las Anod, and he's saying, you know, every diaspora just supports his own tribe. It's humanitarianism for their own people. Uh, and then Musa, who's in Borama, he's, he's similarly an NGO professional. He's saying, you know, the diaspora are motivated by politics. So when an NGO builds a school, it's humanitarian. When a diaspora builds it, it's political. Uh, it's clan support. It's someone who's giving to his relatives. And what's interesting here is that quite clearly the core principles of international humanitarianism, i.e. the idea of common humanity and neutrality, they're mobilized to criticize uh, diaspora aid in this context. By contrast, uh, this quote is by someone who's sort of involved kind of as a middleman uh, between diaspora aid and, and the local community. Uh, and I think this is illustrative of a very common sentiment that we heard sort of a lot. Uh, and he's describing, <coughs> you know, how a huge organization, an INGO, is like a government. You know, they waste money, they mismanage, there's lots of corruption. They rent offices first, but there's no office for this organization. It's not done in the office, everything is done, as Fatima alluded to, in the telephone. Um, and a second example, this is a, a former government employee, actually, and he's describing how international NGOs focus on the number of teachers trained and the amount of money spent a lack of awareness of the local context. So he's asking me, you know, has, has one teacher's behavior been trained or is their attitude the same? Uh, if you're a diaspora, you hire a good teacher because you know them. It's about personality and character. NGOs are interested only in numbers. So these are obviously two separate different examples. Um, but I think what's interesting here is they show how the practices and the values of different forms of humanitarianism are juxtaposed against each other. Um, particularly they're highlighting here the speed and the efficiency and the kind of intimate knowledge of the diaspora. Um, so what does this tell us? Um, I think it tells us that diaspora aid doesn't simply emerge, you know, parallel to international aid, uh, but it actually often takes shape uh, through its relation to it, uh, through juxtaposing itself against it often. Um, and it's worth saying that there are obviously plenty of overlaps too, um, which we won't have time to go into today, unfortunately. Um, but there are also very much some clear differences that come out, uh, and this was across many of the field sites uh, in Somaliland. Somali territories. Um, and I think that it's important to recognize this because, you know, um, <coughs> that there are these debates and there are these discourses uh, on the ground within Somali communities uh, around the values and the practices of the different forms of aid because as uh, we're looking to the future and collaboration potentially between INGOs and diaspora aid, I think understanding this would be crucial for, for sort of working out how that collaboration uh, takes shape. Uh, so that's the aspect of the research that I focus on today. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Jethro, and thank you, everyone. So these are like conversation starters for our um, uh, discussion now. And what we'll do now is that I'll ask a few questions to the panel, but also uh, to the rest of the team uh, in the room, and then we open up uh, for uh, comments and questions uh, from the floor. Um, so I'll gather uh, a three kind set of questions together and then uh, you can uh, pick which one you would like to uh, uh, answer. So one thing that we debated earlier today, so we have this group of people in the room who are working with diaspora associations uh, or diaspora support in different ways or who are studying it or interesting. So what are kind of like the key reflections that you would like to convey to uh, practitioners in this different way, whether it's policymakers, it's um, civil society or NGOs or other Somali diaspora actors? So that's one question. 
The other question is that there's regularly within this field like a call for coordination of diaspora activities um, and a call for capacity deve development. So one of the things that we have also discussed, is this the way forward? And if so, what is uh, important in relation to that? Uh, and then a third uh, question that relates to also what just uh, yeah, everybody, but especially Jeffrey talked about. So what are like the major differences and similarities or convergences between the international humanitarian system uh, and diaspora humanitarianism? So I'll start by um, yeah, asking the panel up here to uh, uh, pick up one of those aspects and comment about it, please. Do we have a volunteer? Um, I guess, yeah, it sort of follows on from the, the presentation maybe, but I think um, that there are many opportunities to support diaspora organizations, um, but it, it also, um, it requires sort of not uh, sort of treating them like NGOs as well. So I think it means that there needs to be a good grasp of local context. Um, so who exactly are you engaging with? Uh, where are they working and why? Um, and this kind of thing. I think also related to what we were talking about before, um, perhaps one of the implications is that uh, with with sort of diaspora aid, there's a huge amount of variables at play, and I think this comes out a little bit in the presentations we've had in terms of, you know, it varies massively where you are, uh, the relationship between the community and the diaspora, the presence of other actors like the state or international aid, uh, the cohesiveness of the diaspora themselves, um, you know, whether there's a political cycle or not. And so understanding all of these requires a lot of uh, knowledge of local context and so on. Um, and it also means, I think, also perhaps relaxing some of the uh, demands around bureaucratic standards that we've seen. Um, particularly, I, I think there's a worry with partnership that it might try to, to sort of turn diaspora organizations, i.e. subclans, uh, into NGOs, uh, instead of perhaps supporting a framework or facilitating uh, dialogue uh, I instead of direct partnerships. That would be my um, initial uh, sort of response. Yeah, uh, I'd also like to add uh, on uh, that uh, policy recommendation, and uh, I would like to say it is uh, uh, apparently important for uh, the diaspora groups to also be proactive. Uh, for right now, you find them very. Uh, reactive in disasters uh, and that's as a result of uh, most probably uh, scarce uh, resources but uh, it is very expensive to be pro uh, to, to be reactive than uh, being proactive i think a lot of damage could be avoided if uh, they also try to think of engaging before disasters happen such that uh, uh, they don't uh, reach to an extent whereby uh, the damage is made and uh, loss of lives and uh, uh, resources is, is, is the result of uh, late engagement. That could be one way or to think of, or and right now that's not how they are organized or uh, their objectives they always uh, stand up for when uh, the damage is, 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 is done. That's one way. Uh, and the other one, I think I would, uh, I, I would also say that uh, diaspora uh, and international organization, humanitarian organizations' uh, relationship or uh, their cooperation is, is, is not uh, present. So there is mistrust you find uh, in their uh, engagements, and most times they don't collaborate on, on, on much of it. So I think there is uh, a need uh, to loosen down uh, or, or to soften uh, bureaucracy among the international organizations to engage with uh, diaspora such that uh, uh, they, they they achieve the same objective and the same with the with the diaspora also the kind of suspicion and uh, uh, engagements uh, lack of engagement they have with the international organizations is, is is not very useful for the humanitarian sector in general so there is need to uh, lower down bureaucracy and also uh, localize or uh, localize humanitarian principles such that uh, collaboration can happen among the two actors thank you Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, um, I would like to add a bit on the fact that both the diaspora humanitarian and the international uh, humanitarians 
all actually work around or revolved around existing networks within the communities and in the context of those communities. So it's important to realize what is actually working. For example, if this ad hoc WhatsApp groups are working, we sh need to know how we can strengthen this and take advantage of this instead of going through all these uh, processes or bureaucratic uh, requirements. Because right now what happens is if there is an emergency, uh, somebody, a prominent person would commit and say, I would uh, loan the family or the kinship the money, a few people, and immediately uh, that, uh, that money would be raised and these are just the same networks. However, if it's going through the, the donors, the donors want uh, the processes to be followed. They want uh, visibility. And as we know, visibility attracts uh, a lot of unwanted uh, situations, especially in Somalia, especially with uh, the Al-Shabaab, because once uh, a project or a fundraising is uh, related to or associated with uh, international donors, it is obviously going to be targeted by Al-Shabaab, who do not target uh, money coming from the diaspora. And as donors would want visibility, like uh, Jethro showed, the we, we are building this road or we are building this, uh, which is calling uh, attention to them. And yes, in as much as the donors would want visibility, uh, because they also report to somebody and have to account for the money. But uh, maybe consider the context itself and the ways these people actually, because they have their own accountability mechanisms and see why these are working uh, in comparison to the, the other processes. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to, to bring in the point of the fact that, uh, you know, the diaspora humanitarian uh, response is a, is a response mechanism. You know, at the heart of this discussion, or the problem is uh, the climate change that's affecting our communities. And it's a common problem throughout Somaliland, Somalia. And I think the discussion should also a little bit, um, you know, the government should be dis having these discussions as to how can we, um, you know, manage climate change? How can we empower our communities so that they are more prepared for disasters? Um, we are seeing currently that there is, in, in Baladwin, as we speak, there is a flood happening in Baladwin. Last month in April, um, in May, May, April, there was a, a flash flood also in Ardo. Uh, it was there last year. There's compassion fatigue coming from the, you know, the side of Somali diaspora. Uh, you know, why this happened last year? Why aren't the communities prepared this year? What is the role of the government? Is there any disaster, uh, you know, disaster uh, preparedness policy and strategy? Uh, uh, you know, at, at regional level, at federal level, at community level. So these are some of the discussions that we are hearing Somali diaspora, you know, speaking about, um, you know, accountability, due diligence, policy, strategy to, to minimize, as Abdurrahman said, the loss of life. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, I would like to uh, follow up on two uh, issues that you raised. And one is about, uh, or the, the panel raised, about uh, accountability. So if you could uh, elaborate on uh, the ac accountability mechanisms that uh, you see within, uh, um, within your work, and also about the different kind of responses to different crises in terms of if you see uh, and what you see of uh, patterns there, please. So I, I, can, I can start uh, just briefly. As I said earlier, I worked with women in Zambia and there are different forms of giving. You know, there is uh, giving at when, when, when a disaster happens, it, you know, there's that initial spontaneous impulsive giving that also Malis feel called upon to respond to. Uh, there's also another more systematic giving that happens at very, you know, clan-based level. Um, in the case of Kardo, when the, 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 gov the Pulen government had set up a national bank account uh, for, for diaspora to, to send money to. And in the, in my, in, in the case study that I did, women gave it at different levels, you know, uh, about accountability. So I want to have, uh, just to give an example. So they gave at individual level to that account number, but they also gave, sent money as a group. And the third way they gave was through the community the civil society in Zambia. They contributed to that. There was also a fourth way, which is more international. They supported other diasporas who were sending, because this happened at a time when COVID was also, 
you know, happening in Somalia. They also support other diasporas to send cargo. The only money they can account for is the money they sent as a group. That they say, we know where it went, who used it, how it was sent. So accountability at that very, you know, um, you know uh, personal level is, 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 you know, the, the people are accountable more to, uh, to that than something that you send somewhere and you don't know who's, who's managing it. Thank you. So from the interactions I've had so far within the Facebook and the WhatsApp groups uh, is that uh, when it comes to accountability, there is rec I'm also working with uh, Somali associations. So these associations have some form of structure and they have committees and they have records of who has contributed and who they've given the money to. Initially, they would have videos. Um, they used um, international uh, aid or donor uh, jargon such as needs assessment because I wanted to know how they decide who needs what. So they would do a needs assessment. And at the end, they also have some form of evaluation in that they will also share how they, they share the records of uh, how many households they've supported. Mainly, they don't distribute money, so it's mainly in the form of either provision of water or digging of boreholes or provision of medication or medicine or food. So they would have a record of how many households they've helped. They would have, actually, I wish I could share a, a photo, but they would have a list of how many households they would have, including their animals. So if they did something for their uh, livestock, they would say, uh, 30, uh, 300 households and X number of uh, uh, livestock. So they have the records, they have the videos to, to, to account for how they actually spent the money or how they distributed the money. Yeah, I would like to add one uh, on the question of the pattern of uh, mobilization of humanitarian resources. In the case of uh, the mosques, the way they handle uh, different crises, you find that uh, they, their hands are tied sometimes due to resources that are uh, <coughs> scarce and uh, they may not uh, uh, focus on a certain uh, you know, crisis uh, several times, even if it is uh, uh, attracting much attention because of the nature of the problem that they need to engage and uh, reach different uh, locations. For example, right now, uh, there are floods, as Sahara said, in Baladwine. Uh, at the same time, there is also a humanitarian crisis in Las Anot, uh, in Sol, Sanak, and Ain. Uh, mosques in Isli this week have started uh, mobilizing resources for Las Anot. I think uh, not that it is so serious than Beledwain, maybe, but it is could be that uh, Beledwain, they have received their share one time, and now that uh, the crisis happened at the same time, they cannot do again in uh, in, in, in Beledwin, they have to focus also in, in different places. Given that those who give uh, towards this humanitarian come across uh, from all the Somali regions, uh, and uh, they also need to see themselves benefiting at different times, and uh, they have to balance uh, that kind of uh, uh, priority <coughs> in terms of giving. The same thing last year, there was uh, this drought that has happened all over the Somali region, and the mosques have had to do contribution for Ethiopia, Zone 5, Northeastern Kenya and even Somalia at different times. So no region received, uh, you know, like uh, mobilization twice, uh, but uh, each of the uh, countries or Mali's uh, inhibit have benefited uh, once, like uh, last year uh, mobilization. And that tells that they also try to balance uh, the kind of uh, giving they do to different crises, such that they keep on getting <coughs> uh, their clients paying towards their bills. Thank you. Yeah, uh, a lot. It's already been said, I would add to that, that for me at least in my research areas, it seemed that scale was very important. So in other words, accountability became more of an issue at the higher scales of kind of mobilization. So <coughs> the level of the kind of uh, the village level or the sub-clan sort of DPN group level, that was mostly there were not too many issues. But once something got scaled up, then you started to get um, more demands for accountability. Um, the other thing that I would add is that there's a, it's often said that it's informal. Um, which is true in some senses, but not in others. So even within the WhatsApp groups, for example, it's quite common for you to see um, uh, sort of norms uh, inscribed in the group descriptions uh, around sort of people who have to give certain amounts of clan or clan payments uh, and norms around what to do, um, you know, when a crisis hits and in terms of uh, sending photos of receipts and so on. 
Um, so it's not like it's a uh, completely informal. Um, then related to that, <coughs> I would say that uh, this point of the types of crisis and the, the kind of responsiveness, um, one of the sort of um, the things that's often much vaunted about diaspora aid is it's very quick to respond and it's able to be flexible. Uh, and I think you see this as well within the groups. So um, there was a number of times I saw that there was some fundraising going on for a political candidate from the sub-clan uh, and then the drought hit. And so a lot of the funds that was being raised for that purpose then gets uh, diverted to the uh, uh, to the drought relief, right? Um, and this is quite significant, I think, and it also speaks to the level of scale um, as well. So you have to have a certain level of trust uh, and a certain level of consensus to be able to uh, to do that, right? You probably couldn't do that in an INGO in the same way. Um, yeah, so that's what I would add. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, before I open the floor, is there anybody from uh, our senior team uh, who would like to comment on the questions uh, we have discussed so far? <laughs> it doesn't really seem the case, so I'll uh, open up and if you feel the inclination during the last 20 minutes, uh, feel free. Uh, so, reaction, questions, uh, comments? Um, Duale, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you can hear me now. Uh, I have uh, uh, some questions and or comments for Fatima. <laughs> for Fatima. Uh, and also, I will come back to also to Zahra. Uh, the same question, actually, or a comment, I would rather say, uh, about the <coughs> diaspora uh, assistance being given or distributed through kinship, clan-based, and so on. Now, uh, <coughs> I am here in Denmark, and I cannot speak, of course, of all diasporas around the world. But I will try to speak for the Somali diaspora in Denmark. The Somali diaspora in Denmark, apart from the fact that each and every group, of course, gives some family relationship, relates, and so on and so on, we do actually have a absolute cooperation among all of us, one of the things we are trying to eliminate, <coughs> which is not easy to do so, because the, uh, the world around us is keeping us on it, because we are reminded day and again about clan, 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 clan. <coughs> That's what they hate most. Uh, we are trying to overcome the isolation of clanism in such a way that whenever a calamity happens, takes place in Somalia, no matter which region, city, place, uh, we do collect uh, aid money among all of us as Somalis. Uh, we did that for the, uh, the fire in Hargeisa. We did that for the flooding in Belitwain. We did that for the flooding in, in, in Garoui. <coughs> and we did that also for the flooding in Bardera, which not so many people talk about. <laughs> uh, so uh, we are trying to, whenever it, the problem is concerned about a disaster, we work together across clans, regions, and states. That's just for your information. So Denmark is uh, just uh, trying to lead the way to show that Somalism, inter-Somalism is very strong in Denmark. I know that, I case that because I have been here for 57 years in Denmark and I have never seen, uh, I have been traveling around. Now we are trying to reach America, uh, transatlantic uh, cooperation with Somali societies, Somali diaspora in the USA. That's uh, uh, just for the precision of that. Not all of us do work in a clan basis only. Politicization of the diaspora humanitarianism, I think it was a 
Dar Rahman, yes. That's a problem. We know that. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's for you who are making, making the studies and publishing information and data to, uh, to divulge, to, to show us uh, and uh, to talk and make it public, actually, so we know this problem. We know that uh, disproportionate of the politicians in Somalia now they are diaspora people origins, uh, and that's uh, what we call diaspora in Somalia now. At least as far as I know, in many places it's called not diaspora but the usebora. <laughs> the usebora is a terrible thing in Somali. <laughs> So they call us the Yusbara when we come there. Because they all think that we are all looking for jobs, <laughs> but we are not. Uh, and uh, women's role, Zahra. If there were no women, there would be no Somalia today. No matter whether, whether it is in Zambia, in Sisley, Copenhagen, or Minnesota, uh, women are the lifeline of the Somali society, society today, in and out of Somalia. So God gave us the good girls and keep that beautiful poem. I, I really, I was touched, I almost cried when you were reading, it's the English version especially. That was very strong. <laughs> uh, Clan aid, I said already. Now, to illustrate what we are doing in Denmark, in the Somali diaspora in Denmark, is in our, and I'm coming from a, a small uh, diaspora organization. We built a school in Beladhawa. And then I came to visit Dolo, uh, look and Garbahari. And in Garbahari, uh, we gave some equipment, school equipment, uh, to uh, chairs and tables and things like that to a school, a uh, couple of schools actually. And then we visited one of the uh, initial beginning secondary school, which was in a very horrible uh, state. And uh, uh, I was so sorry to see that. And when I was trying to uh, go, I said goodbye. Then a young girl stood up and she had obviously a poem. And she said, I can only read that in Somali, so you must be with me, uh, the non Somalis. She said, Other Ijok. Then I stopped. She said, Sit down. And I sat down. And then she read her poem. Urbajak to Somal, a Garadaha Kukaranol, Salang, the Mabadano Galbig, a Miratan, Idinso Kadimea. Ardak, the Mabadano, all Iriri Badan Eo, or Rachok, the Arakto, Kamara Kukabato, Gado, Lad of Te, Galo, Miat Katur Tambit. Mahad or Satan or Rima no good deed. I cried, I tell you, I cried. That was uh, the girl's poem which prompted me to say, I promise you, I will build a school for you. And we built the best secondary school in Somalia, in Garbahari, for 350 young people. And that school has been actually uh, declared the best secondary school in Somalia for three years in a row now. That was the girl who was the reason for that. Uh, Thank you so much. We Thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, I can keep talking. Give yes. me one hour more. I know. <laughs> one so hour the, more. The power of poems, it's not a small thing. Uh -uh. So uh, please, uh, there was a lot to uh, to discuss there, but please uh, pick yeah, one of uh, what you would like to comment on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, Duale, uh, I agree completely that when there is, as Abdurrahman and everybody has termed it, a spectacular crisis or crisis isolated to one part, the whole of Somalia comes together. All the whole of Somali diasporas come together. And this is when uh, the Somali Nimo or Walalti Nimo is awakened because now everybody is contributing to that event. However, things like drought, yes, we contribute to 
to the nation one, but it does not mean you do not contribute to the kinship, kinsh kinship one. So it is, and also not just kinship, your immediate family wants the, the regular monthly bill. So we are doing, uh, the diaspora is doing, I keep saying we because I am a diaspora, near diaspora. So we contribute in uh, various ways. And the only reason I'm uh, saying kinship is because the WhatsApp groups are mainly used by the kinship associations. And that is where they do their communication and fundraising. Thank you. I'll just, uh, I'll also add uh, that uh, when we talk about uh, clans mobilization, we are not like making it evil uh, that Somalis are, uh, it's not like the Qabiyalad thing. It, it is a good thing that they also mobilize in that line. And uh, you say Denmark's diaspora is different. I agree, but again, uh, there is a pattern, the way you have uh, now narrated your stories that you have implemented projects in Garbahari, Belad Howard, Dolo, and Lok, and there's likelihood that uh, what I've been talking is visible there. If I'm not wrong, because there should be a relationship between why, uh, you know, you guys are implementing projects in five districts that uh, have a, con a common denominator, something like that. That's how all the diaspora operate, that they do their best in where they can reach because of the, uh, what they can, you know, contribute among themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duale. We met Mr. Duale outside. He was one of the, if not the only, uh, you know, first guest out there. So that's how we know his name. It's not because we met outside or we met in Copenhagen. It's not the case. Uh, but we saw him there. We chatted, and um, that's that's how we got to know him. Thank you, Mr. Duale, for your uh, comments, um, compliments, also a little bit of critique about you know the issue of clan, and um, I think you know. In, to put it in context, um, I think there's a difference between tribalism or favoritism, favoring somebody because he's your clan, and clan-based service delivery. As you all know, there was war in Somalia, and you know there was there was no state, there was no government, there was no rule of law, and it was everybody for himself and family or kin or clan. I don't know how you name it. You know they they were the ones who were doing all the important work, uh, building schools. Uh, you know, health sector, uh, everybody for himself, the village, the town. And I think there's a difference between the two. What, where a clan becomes a problem is when you sort of, you know, um, favor your brother uh, or defend him in when he's in the wrong. Thank you also for telling us something about the, the Somali diaspora in Denmark. It's good to hear that you are looking beyond the confines of clan, you know, and um, clanism. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think most has been said, but just briefly to sort of add on the politicization of aid thing, you're talking about um, sort of diaspora return and how dias uh, you know <coughs> being involved in, in these projects can sort of prefigure a political return or return for political office. I think it's also very much the case in communities as well, that if you can <laughs> attract diaspora funding for building a school or something, then this is also a way that you can uh, prefigure or <coughs> move towards political office. Um, and so that's an important thing. There was another thing which also came up a lot, which is that some of the most uh, uh, sort of knowledgeable people around uh, sort of a lot of diaspora projects, at least in the areas that I was in, um, particularly in more rural areas, uh, were actually uh, sort of building contractors or construction contractors who were doing a lot of the um, uh, the projects. Um, and that also similarly worked through the, the WhatsApp groups and the informal networks. Um, and I think that's also an interesting aspect, that wider kind of political economy uh, that, that brings uh, these projects together and, and yeah if you look at it from the bird's eye view you actually have a very sort of interesting alternative development uh, sort of model playing out uh, concurrently um, uh, with the state and international NGOs. Yeah. Great thank you we have uh, room for uh, time for a few more questions or comments yes please um, thank you for the presentation uh, my name is Sihan, and I'm a master in global health and actually uh, doing a master thesis on this subject next, after this summer. Um, I have uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to point out two and then hope to catch 
any of you after her. Um, um, so one of the root causes was climate change, as you said, and I w and Abderrahman pointed out to that he wishes that the diaspora will be more proactive than reactive. And then I kind of thought as a question, like, um, are there any like initiative initiative in Somalia to be proactive? Because I would think that the people affected also are like fatigued <laughs> um, to be hit on a drought and a drought and a drought and a flood if they live in that area. So like, are there any collaboration or like initiative of actually doing something about the root causes or, um, yeah. And then should I just say the second question? Um, and then a lot of you are almost done with your research. So I was just um, uh, interested in what is the gap in the research you have done or like is there uh, something that you wish you had a lot more time to dig into? Two really good questions. Uh, are there other questions? Then we'll... Uh, yes, please. Yeah, we can start there and then uh, we go to you afterwards. Okay, I'm very interested in inequalities and inequities, and I uh, know uh, there's a tendency when you talk about Somali, you talk about clan and clans and clans, and you sort of forget other types of inequalities. And I'm curious about what patterns you notice in terms of it could be gender, it could be geography, it could be the city, and you know the land, and other types of inequalities. And uh, another question I want to ask is also about the geopolitical connection. I think international humanitarianism is often connected to the geopolitics. What about diaspora gate? Is there a connection to activism, climate change, gender, and also like a break with the global north? Is there is there an opportunity, opportunity for that? And last but not least, I'm very curious about the diaspora returning back to Somalia. Is there... Um, a discussion about power dynamics there. A lot of them come from the global north, so is there, and take jobs in certain positions, is there a power dyna dynamic there? Yes, I hope it makes sense. Who was the other? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so I have two questions, but I'll just start with the first one. The, the first one would be going for all of you, so any one of you can just chime in. In acknowledging the significance of kinship as an avenue of diaspora support, does it also function as a barrier for someone to support an area or region as they may not be from there and thereby their support not well received? And the second question would be for Zara. Could you elaborate on compassion fatigue a bit more and what can we do as diaspora members to kind of overcome it? Thank you. So really good questions. We could uh, talk about those for uh, a long time. Um, we have the reception afterwards, so we are a bit flexible, not but not like super, super uh, flexible. So uh, please uh, go ahead um, and we'll uh, go maybe five minutes over time before the Sambusas are calling. Just to respond to, you didn't say your name, Mahmoud. I think I met you at the airport. <laughs> yeah. You can tell that story. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> So the other day we were going to attend the ECAS conference in Cologne, in Germany, the European Conference for Africa Studies. And uh, we're at the airport here in, in Copenhagen, and uh, the three of us, and this young man approached us and he said, uh, we got talking, you know, we explained we're going there, we're from here. And he was like, I saw this event on this and I'm coming. And he was so proud of us. And he was so excited that I told the entire team and it's good to have you here, Mahmoud. Uh, sorry for forgetting your name. Actually, I actually wrote it down somewhere. And it's good to see you here. Um, compassion fatigue is, you know, I, I, I don't know the exact definition, but we're seeing a trend. We're seeing a trend among the Somali diaspora that when, when, a, when a disaster happens the first time, they really respond swiftly, uh, wholeheartedly, passionately, patriotically. But when the same disaster happens a second time, they become more reluctant. And when it happens a third or fourth time, like in Baladwain and, um, and in Qardo, they, they just don't even talk about it, you know. And, um, you know, they're, they're asking questions on Twitter. There's a hashtag, you know, about Qardo, for example, asking what, what is the role of the government in preventing this? What will it take for the communities to be better prepared 
We know every year in April there's going to be a flood. Why aren't the communities prepared? And I think they have valid questions which need, you know, to be, which need to be addressed. Um, kinship as a barrier. I think, yes, kinship sometimes can be uh, for, for that particular group of, you know, king folk uh, empowering. It can be um, a good thing when I feel supported by my clan during disasters, but there are other people and we have seen this from our studies that there is an element of exclusion, that there are certain people who are excluded from accessing this, this um, aid. Uh, you know, I'm talking about the IDP community throughout the regions, uh, Somalia, Somaliland, there are IDP communities, the internally displaced peoples. These are Somalis. They're not foreigners. They are Somalis displaced as a result of climate change disasters or as a result of the war. And in that particular town, they are called IDPs. And they, are, they fall outside of the, you know, they're in, they are in the margins of society. And uh, unfortunately, the international community is sort of in strengthening that because they are providing, to come back to a question of in inequalities, they are providing support to these people in their confines, in that camp. So education in the camp, health service delivery in the camp, whatever you know, projects will be de uh, delivered are delivered in the camps. And I think that sort of enhances you know, exclusion and widens the gap. I will leave my colleagues to respond to the other points. Um, so I would touch on the question on inequalities. Uh, yes, uh, I feel like these processes to some level or to some extent are reinforcing existing inequalities. I would touch on, on the gender. We keep saying uh, which means the women are the backbone of our communities. And then th I think throughout all our research we see the main role that women play, the key role, and that they're the forefront, also not forgetting the youth. Uh, however, when it comes to, to these important decisions, uh, they don't have the same agency that the elders would have, that the sheikhs or religious leaders will have. I think th this is uh, an existing inequality within the co Somali community, and it still persists despite the fact that these people now have agency. And then on the question on uh, proactive initiatives, uh, completely not related to my PhD or diaspora humanitarianism, but uh, in the international um, uh, agencies or humanitarian uh, actors, I know of um, most, uh, for example, like the UN uh, agencies, they do proactive uh, initiatives such as uh, they predict, uh, they have systems that predict uh, flooding and all that, and they do radio programming that informs uh, people. And they also have messaging, both written and both IVR, that is in voice uh, to the people, informing them that uh, rainfall is coming and that the ones living on the river range should uh, move away from that. I was aware that they recently did that. But then the problem is um, with predicting the weather, Somalis would challenge you and ask you, are you God? How do you know it's going to rain tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll also say that uh, the question on proactiveness, like uh, Siham asked, thank you. I think there is a lot that can be done, but also it is subject to further research uh, in that uh, you, you find in Somalia we have uh, always two extreme uh, crises that happen, drought, then flooding. So, of course, there should be something that, we c that can be done in between these. Uh, although some of the interventions need uh, like uh, high-scale engagement of governments, again, the diaspora could also, uh, this possibility they engage. Of course, when there is this flooding, there could be a form of water harvesting whereby uh, the, 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 that kind of water harvesting is used to improve food security. <coughs> there is uh, always nutrition problem. You find a lot of people uh, are, uh, are always uh, suffering from uh, malnutrition. And if you harvest, of course, such water, maybe in water uh, catchments, which can, I think, uh, affordably be, uh, be, be done by the diaspora and used to irrigate, 
uh, maybe vegetables and uh, growing vegetables and uh, groceries, it can improve uh, food insecurity, m m uh, nutritional level of, of the locals. So there's a way to avert maybe the next crisis like the drought before it comes and uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, problem happens. A lot can be done in between such that uh, the, the problems uh, that could happen is reduced. That's what I think, and uh, many other solutions could be uh, could be on the table if uh, people think of it. Uh, the, the 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 question on uh, inequalities, of course, it is well manifested inequalities, uh, uh, not only through uh, the clan, also the clan, uh, the geography, as you mentioned, is is an issue. There are areas in Somalia that uh, diaspora r representation is higher than uh, others. Particularly, you find that. Uh, inequalities that was experienced during the Somali government is extended now to even uh, diaspora representation uh, population in, in, in the West, uh, such that you find uh, regions or uh, areas whose people were um, majorly in government during that time are well represented in government, whereas uh, some regions like you find the Southwest regions of the country, uh, they are less diaspora interventions because they don't have uh, much presence in the diaspora, so it is uh, intergenerational or uh, whatever of inequalities that uh, uh, has uh, gone beyond uh, what it was one time. Uh, I think I'll leave at that, Jethro. Yeah, I think I'm the only one keeping you from the sambusas, so I'll um, be brief, but uh, I think on the questions of inequality is a really good one. Um, and yes, gender, class, rural, urban divides, um, but th th one of the interesting things that particularly came out in particularly in some of the more rural areas was this gender divide because I remember <coughs> uh, asking one particular elder if he liked you know, about diaspora and so like, oh, it's great. What about the NGOs? Oh, they just give to the women. Um, and then we spoke to the uh, women's committee in the village and they said, yeah, well, they engage with us because uh, uh, give it to the men, they'll just chew it, spend it all on cat. So there were these real divides uh, in those terms, uh, which came out uh, quite a few different times. Um, but I think, yeah, the point to make is obviously that diaspora aid is not separate from the power structures inherent in, you know, any society, on Somali society. Um, with, and this relates a little bit to the kinship as a kind of barrier rather than being productive. One thing that you certainly can get is uh, it will produce kind of uneven patterns of development, I think. So, uh, sort of drive along a road, there's one town, it doesn't have any, ask, you know, a, a diaspora projects, nothing. In the next town, there's loads of stuff built by the diaspora, and it turns out that in the first town, it's just one subclan, and in the second town, it's two different subclans in, uh, inhabiting. And so there's a, an element of uh, tit for tat. One builds a school, and another one decides to build uh, a madrasa or something. And, um, and so it can be productive, right? Because you get school and a madrasa, and you get all these things. Um, but it also can be uneven, and I think that's an issue sometimes with um, why government officials and stuff are less uh, enthusiastic, because they feel like it messes up their national development plans and stuff. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. But okay, so there are two burning questions or comments. They need to be short because oh, right. the reception is calling. So first, uh, the gentleman here, and then uh, Professor Karuti. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, um, and thanks for all the presentations, and particularly thank you for the poem uh, that you read initially. It was very touching, really. Thanks a lot. <coughs> I have uh, uh, two questions. Uh, first uh, relates to uh, the humanitarian uh, humanitarianism. Um, how, how do you relate this to uh, the overall remittances that are actually uh, being provided, which is about, uh, as I understand, about 25% of Somalia GDP, which is actually coming from, uh, from, the, di from the diaspora? Um, is this humanitarian uh, support a part of the uh, normal remittances? Um, uh, and, also, and the second uh, question will then uh, address the issue of uh, to which extent uh, are the humanitarian uh, support provided from the diaspora involving the local recipients in order to ensure that impact is actually increased? Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you very much. There was a question asked at the corner there on uh, what is it that would have been done if there was sufficient time to look at, at these issues. Of course, every research produces uh, areas for further research and for deeper insights. But I think one issue, uh, a, a number of issues that require much more attention than we, than we are giving, and of course we are not saying that the research is complete, is the question of uh, policy 
options that are available, especially now that we see diaspora has got impact that has not been looked at before. Um, diaspora uh, has got certain values that seem to be having better biding uh, impact than uh, what we have with international uh, aid assistance, you know. Um, and that in itself is something that people have got to start reflecting upon because really have we, and it, I'm not saying it's comparison, but there are new insights that are coming up that are pointing to the direction that uh, diaspora is having much more impact than uh, what the existing studies uh, have uh, been seeking to do. Uh, related to this is the whole question of um, what happened in Africa in the 1960s, uh, technical assistance, when many governments were opting to educate their people outside of the country and then have them back. This is a situation where people have voluntarily gone outside or forced it to go out of the country, but they are now coming back again not in a structured way, but coming again. And that impact of their coming back uh, to take uh, up responsibilities of building their own nations, assisting local communities, is something that seems to be uh, missing middle in all these particular discussions. No one is paying attention to that particular impact. Some people are paying attention to remittances, uh, to, 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 to support in building basic services, but the technical assistance that is accompanying them, which was not paid for by anyone, is something that is missing in all these particular discussions and it's worth paying attention to. And there's a final, very short question uh, on the front and then we really have to end. Thank you. I think my question is was partially uh, answered by this gentleman who just uh, talked, but I just want to say thank you for a very nice presentations and a good discussion. Um, so I was wondering how we could avoid um, falling into this trap of aid dependency. Um, we were talking about um, fatigue of, you know, um, compassion fatigue, these crises happening, um, and there's no really prevention happening. Um, and it could look like inactive uh, effort because people might expect aid to to arrive next time disaster happens so how can we as diaspora uh, be aware of this uh, trap thank you okay so what we'll do now is that we continue the discussion uh, next door so questions will be answered but not here because uh, we need to uh, move on but i'm volunteering uh, the panel to uh, answer uh, uh, the uh, two sets of very important uh, questions to you. So I would like to thank everybody, our wonderful panel, our wonderful uh, audience. I love that we had Somali poems here uh, today, an exchange of Somali poems. That was uh, really great. So thank you so much. And you can find more here on the website. Thanks.